Hi, welcome to the DRH show where I have wide ranging conversations with fascinating people. We talk about all things psychology, mental health and wellness. I usually have a one to one chat here, but you're in for a treat today because it's a double whammy. I'm joined by two psychologists. First, we have Dr. Hafet Smeerman, and I have to mention that I cross paths with her because I'm doing a PhD at Edinburgh where she is a lecturer. And uh, we also have Dr. Megan Marsak, who is a pediatric psychologist from the University of Kentucky. Um, Dr. Marsak also co-authored an article with Dr. Mehrman for PsychReg. We'll talk more about that. Um, Dr. Mehrman and Dr. Marsak, um, thanks for joining me. Hi. It's good to be here. Okay. Well, first, um, I'll, uh, I, I want to hear about your background, your backstory, your trajectory in life. So let's start. At, let's start off first with Dr. Mehrman. Oh, sure. Happy to. Uh, yeah. So I'm a developmental psychologist. Um, I did my bachelor's degree um, at the University of Delaware um, in psychology and foreign languages and literature. And then I did my PhD at Fordham University um, in developmental psychology, focus on developmental psychology uh, there. Um, I did my dissertation a great many years ago, it feels like at this point, um, on um, parent-child interactions in the context of healthy eating and weight management among preschool kids um, in Head Start settings, which is uh, like schooling for low-income uh, young children to get them ready for school. Um, and then I just kind of got interested from there in child and adolescent health, primary prevention and health promotion. Um, so I did, after that, I went to Philadelphia, went to the city of Philadelphia, worked in the nonprofit sector for a couple of years, um, developing and evaluating youth development programs for um, at risk youth, so youth living in high poverty, high crime areas. And then after that, I moved to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where I met uh, Dr. Marzak. Um, and that's where our paths initially crossed track, um, crossed paths, and um, started doing injury prevention work. Um, they're like, largely related to traffic injuries, so preventing motor vehicle injuries um, for teenagers and for, for children riding in cars, and um, did that for eight or nine years, and then moved to the University of Alabama for three years, where I was an assistant professor and kept all this stuff going and I've been here at the University of Edinburgh um, as a lecturer in applied psychology and public health for two-ish years now I would say. Um, so that's my kind of quick academic bio. Um, is that kind of what you're looking Yeah, at? thank you. Well, we'll explore more about um, what you do as a lecturer. Now, let's hear it with Dr. Marsak. Um, please give us a quick snapshot of what you do um, as, an, as an academic. Uh, sure. So my path was um, definitely included lots of school along the way as well. I started in a tiny liberal arts college in um, called Baldwin Wallace College, and I got a, a degree in neuroscience psychology there and went on to develop a specialization in clinical psychology. I graduated from the University of Toledo, and then I moved on to do my um, internship training and fellowship training out at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I spent about 10 years out there and what I was really diving into and becoming really interested in at that point is trying to figure out how we can support kids who have medical conditions in their families and, and working on that path. So my training there led to support that specialization. Um, and then I spent about 10 years at um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a couple of years at University of Pennsylvania there as well before joining faculty over at um, University of Kentucky. And here I am a pediatric psychologist. So I do some work with um, supporting kids directly, some clinical care with kids with um, medical conditions and their families. And then I also have a program of re research around supporting kids with medical conditions and their families. Okay. Um, thank you for giving us your um, your your background, um, Dr. Merman and Dr. Marsak. I just want to quickly ask Dr. Marsak, um, I understand that you work with trauma-informed medical care. So could you please tell us more about this aspect of your work? Sure. So my overall professional goal is to try to figure out how we can make medical care better for kids and families. And so one of the pieces of work that I do is around trauma-informed medical care which is really focusing on training um, healthcare professionals and training anybody who interacts with kids through a healthcare system on trauma-informed care principles. 
And so what that means is, is kind of educating everybody in the healthcare system about how common trauma is. And we talk about in that the trauma that we come in with. So things that have happened to us before we enter the healthcare system and how that might impact medical care. Then we also talk about how the things that are required in medical care, sometimes amazing life-saving procedures can be traumatic for kids and families. Um, so for example, sometimes a, a kids have to you know, go in for any emergency surgery and um, some of the procedures that they go through for that can be really, really scary for kids and really, really um, scary for their families. Um, but also we're gonna save their life as part of that process. Um, but those things have to happen and they can serve as a potential trauma you know, and in that pathway. And then we work with medical teams to come up with strategies of ways that they can help um, recognize kids that might be having traumatic stress reactions, recognize family members that might be having traumatic stress, stress reactions, um, and then figure out what can we do to support our kids and families along the way. So thinking about their overall um, kind of health and not just their physical health, but also their mental health as well. And of course, um, like what um, Dr. Merman has said earlier, your work actually overlaps. And um, is that also part of your work as uh, I understand, Dr. Merman, that you're also the Associate Director of CADP? Do you also focus more on trauma or is there another aspect of your work? Sure. So I tend to focus on the prevention side um, and Megan's kind of on the like, post-injury care and recovery side or post-trauma care and recovery side. So most of my work um, does focus on preventing traumas, preventing um, critically ill kids uh, from getting that sick. Um, but, you know, in the kind of, there is a space there where, where, where uh, Dr. Mars and I do overlap. Um, and that's kind of you know, how we came to working together. Yeah, when we worked together um, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we worked in an injury center and we ranged the care that we gave kids and the research that we were doing there was all the way from primary injury prevention. So trying to figure out how do we prevent injuries from happening in the first place with Dr. Hayfitz Merman did a lot of that work um, all the way through once an injury has happened, how do we either prevent it from happening again, um, but also prevent the negative psychological reactions that can sometimes times come along with that. And so then we kind of partner to look at the whole trajectory of an injury experience and see what we can do to kind of optimize kids' health outcomes. I, I just want to quickly um, um, add some information about um, doctors, Dr. Mirman's role. Um, as like as like, as what I've mentioned earlier, um, I'm also doing PhD at the University of Edinburgh, where our paths cross. Um, I'm also a member of CADP as a postgraduate researcher. Um, this is a, the CADP stands for the Center for Applied Developmental Psychology. Um, what I'll do is I'll pop in the link um, at the video description also for anyone who wants to learn more about the center, which um, Dr. Merman directs, um, you can learn more about it. Now, Do Dr. Masa, just a follow-up question. I understand aside from your um, academic um, work, you're also the CEO of the Sally Coping Company. Um, so tell us more about the primary goal of your company. Okay. Um, so the goals of that company really align with my overall professional goals of trying to figure out what can we do to really support kids and families through that whole kind of trajectory of medical care. And one of my very favorite parts of my job is being able to create resources for kids and families to use independently. So ideally, all of our kids have access to mental health providers as they need them. Um, but also sometimes hard things just happen and we want to try to equip and empower our parents to be able to, to manage them. Um, and so the company was actually formed out of a, over a decade of research that, that we've been doing. Some of that research started at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and it's carried forward through here at the University of Kentucky. Um, and so we spun the company out really with the mission of trying to help our kids and our parents live their fullest lives, even you know when they have a medical event um, and medical condition that they're trying to manage. And the primary um, product that we have right now is called the Selly Coping Kit. And the kit has a stuffed critter that's for engagement. You can actually kind of see it over, over my corner, over back there, the little stuffed figure that's that's sticking out over there, that's Selly. So it's a stuffed critter to really help engage kids in the kit. Um, and then it has a guide for caregivers. So I have one right here I can hold up and show here. So this is the version for kids with injury. 
And in each of these guides, there's um, research on kind of what is the hardest things of having an injury and what are the things that we can that we know can help kids who have an injury, for example, for the injury kit. Um, and, and then we have a deck of coping cards um, for kids as well that, again, we've used research to learn what are the things that we know is really hard about the medical event and then what are the things that we can do to help our kids through it. And so using that together, um, the kits have, you know, that caregiver guide, a deck of coping cards for kids, and then the celly critter that kind of integrates them into the kit and really thinking about, you know, what are the strategies that parents can help their kids use? So we've done that. We started that. That was started, goodness, over 10 years ago, we created our very first kit for kids with cancer. Um, and since then, we've done research and created kit, kits for kids with um, sickle cell disease, food allergy, injury, um, eosinophilic esophagitis. And I must admit that one took me a really long time to learn how to pronounce and spell. Um, and then we also just recently um, came out with a kit for siblings of kids with medical conditions. Because one of the things that we know, and I know um, Dr. Hayfitzmerman and I will talk about this a little bit probably as well as we go along is when a single child has a medical condition, it doesn't just affect that, that child. It can affect other siblings. It can affect parents. Um, and so we really are trying to create resources that will support the whole family and make them more broadly accessible. Uh, and of course, it's not just um, it's, it's not just really like the, the physical um, aspect of of you know children growing up and um, the parents that you're helping. Um, just like what I've mentioned during the intro, um, both of you also look after the mental health and well being of children and kind of give um, parents the idea on how to um, kind of um, give give them guidance. Um, in fact, you actually wrote an article on Psychreg, um, giving tips to parents on how to talk about um, their children um, about COVID-19. So if you could kind of um, give us more idea of what you wrote about um, Dr. Mehman. Sure, I can. <laughs> um, so one of the things I kind of felt was missing um, in the discourse, um, especially at this stage in the, the pandemic, was as kids increasingly get sick with COVID, um, is how to talk to them about, about it. Um, and there's a lot of guidance around um, how that talk about the, the pandemic in general. Um, changes you might see, like why you're wearing a mask, why you see people wearing masks, um, changes in school, why mom and dad, um, or you know whatever, the, why parents are home more often. Um, so like, that kind of thing was out, but not so much about um, when, it, when your kid gets sick, what do you say to them? Uh, keeping in mind that kids are different and that they're gonna vary in how they respond to being, you know, to, 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 the, to their diagnosis. They're gonna vary in their you know, physical response as well as their mental health response. Um, and just as a mom and as a psychologist, you know, um, you know, I could see in the conversations I was having with other moms, um, my own kids were sick. Um, and I had to have some con like tough conversations with my own children. Um, I just felt like there wasn't enough out there yet. Um, we're just like a little bit behind uh, where we needed to be. Um, so that was the kind of uh, main motivation for you know me reaching out to Dr. Marzak to kind of say you know I think we have something unique that we can offer families here. And Dr. Marza, could you give us some idea of what kind of feedback did you receive after writing that article? Yeah, so I think, um, well, just going back to what Dr. Hafez Merman said, I think it, the rate of how many kids were getting sick, it, it just took off so quickly. Um, and I think a lot of parents were not prepared for all of a sudden, um, you've got COVID kind of all through the community. Um, it, and it, it was really interesting to watch this happen, you know, because I'm here based in the U.S. Um, and Dave, Dr. Hafitz Meerman based over there um, and in the U.K. over there um, to see some of the parallels of what was happening even internationally for, for our kids and families. And so I think it really is, took a lot of people by surprise because it was just as we we're starting to get back to normal. Everyone was starting to breathe. And then we had this new variant come through that was really affecting many more children. And I think Dr. Hafitz Meerman mentioned there was a lot of materials out there for like, how do you get through the pandemic? How do you do homeschooling here in the U.S.? That was something we were 
many of us were managing, myself included, my two wonderful, amazing, energetic boys um, as you're trying to work and like manage the pandemic. And I had been involved in, in creating some of those resources. But when she reached out, I said, absolutely, there's this gap. Like, what do you tell kids? So what are the specific things? How do you talk about it with kids in a developmentally appropriate way? Um, that was really missing. Um, so I think that those are the things that we kind of pulled pulled in to, to, to talk about in that article. Absolutely. And like what you've already highlighted, there's so many resources there um, talking about how to manage our mental health. And most of them are actually focusing on, on young people, but we tend to forget that's also a more vulnerable demographic. So um, I'll also put a link to that. So for anyone who wants to um, read your article, um, they can um, they, they can have a look at your um, article that you've written for PsychReg. Now, my question for you is that because both of you are working with um, with children and young people, and you know, there's, there's a lot of you know the, the rigmarole of ethics application just to ensure that you know they're being protected, their welfare being protected. But as researchers, as psychologists, um, how do you prevent your own traumatization when listening to accounts of trauma, um, especially you, Dr. Megan, I understand that the bulk of your work um, lies with helping children who have experienced traumatic um, events. Yeah, maybe I'll start with that one. Um, and so I think what you're referring to there is probably secondary traumatic stress, um, which is another kind of part of the trauma-informed care training work that we do is teaching other healthcare providers and, and mental health folks how to kind of prevent traumatizing themselves from just hearing the stories and um, dealing with really, really hard situation every day. And I think, so I actually have done many of these trainings for others. I can speak to it personally, how I try to manage it as well. Um, but kind of the general guidance we give, um, there is um, one kind of way to think about it is an ABC model that has been created. I think this is available on healthcaretoolbox.org if anyone wants to take a, a, bit, a better look at it but it, it talks about awareness, balance, and connection. And so really awareness, be, making sure that you're paying attention to your own emotional reactions. I'll share my one of my own um, stories has to do with chocolate. And I know kind of depending on how much chocolate I'm eating, where my stress level is. And I've shared this very publicly. So I feel like everyone's always looking to see what I'm eating. But um, you know, if I love chocolate, it's part of my life. You know, If I'm eating a regular amount, it's a good day, it's fine. Um, I know for me, when my stress starts to increase to a certain level, I start to eat more chocolate and like, okay, you're in the warning, take a look at this. And then if I stop eating chocolate altogether, that's like a really red flag. Like, okay, you need to get an intervention needs to be done. You need to dial back your stress and take a look at things. So one part of, um, for me that I practice myself is just be aware of your own stress reactions, kind of take that time to recognize listen to other people um, who might recognize your stress reactions before you recognize them. Um, so that it pieces the awareness balance. Um, so making sure you're, you're having things that you can do outside of work too. And that looks different for everybody. So for some people that's art, some people that's exercise, some people that's lean walks out in the park, connecting with nature, um, you know, but there's not any one perfect answer to how you do that, but just making sure that you've got some balance um, potentially within your work. So if you've got a lot of really hard stories coming in, see if you can find some other work also that is a little bit lighter also. So kind of out balancing both in your work, but then outside of your work too. Um, and then thinking about connecting. So that can look like family connections, friend connections, spiritual connections. Um, for me, I've got some amazing um, friends and family that I definitely make sure I stay in touch with. And if I start to have a, a situation that's really tough or a client that's really tough, um, you know, making sure you're doing that connection outside of work. And then also I think making sure you have professional colleagues that if you need to talk about something in particular that's going on um, within your work environment that you have the space to do that. So those are my basic, my own kind of strategies too um, that I kind of share in the trainings that we do around trauma-informed care. Because we also talk about providers um, health as well and providers mental health when we talk about trauma-informed care because we know healthy providers are going to be able to deliver better quality medical care to kids and families too um but i also use the strategies that that i preach as well there well um th thank you for those um tips um dr uh, masak now dr merman i understand that you predominantly work with prevention but um from your own experience how do you mitigate the risk of working with children and young people 
I mean, so again, I do mostly prevention stuff. So most of the kids that I work with and young people are healthy um, and well and like pretty well functioning because um, it is it is primary prevention and health promotion. Um, but in like a research context, you know, because I do look at you know often injury scenarios or situation in which there is the potential for a trauma reaction or like a physical injury, um, all of the research protocols kind of go through ethics um, review, um, and we look at the risk benefit ratio there. So do the risks of the research um, are they less um, than the benefits that could be obtained? Um, so all of that kind of goes through um, pretty standard um, and strict you know, ethical review guidelines by um, both the, if there's a funder for that research as well as the you know, institution that's sponsoring the work. Um, personally, um, for me, I mean, I'll often come into contact, I would say, with parent advocates um, in the context of my work. Um, so these are parents um, who lost a child um, and, you know, a lot of many of them may kind of choose to do some advocacy work as a way of coping and making meaning um, out of the you know death or injury of their child um, so for me you know i often have had you know um intimate conversations with those parents um and you want to be you know supportive and listen and you know do that work and it is a good reminder i think for me as a scientist who develops intervention programs and who does policy work to just you know to see, you know, the impact um, there, and to work collaboratively with them. But it can it can be upsetting, of course it can. Um, but that's kind of why I'm I'm here, I guess. And when you do the international collab collaboration, um, th does it come that there's a, a conflict of ethical, shall we say, um, ethical protocol, especially when you're working with different countries? Have you ever come across with that? Typically, there's like another version of me or, you know, there's another investigator in that country and they're the lead, you know, they're typically the point person there. So we would just work collaboratively with them to figure out, um, you know, what are the challenges, what are the, um, what are the local policy, um, what's lo what are the local policy constraints, what are the laws, um, you know, and then we just kind of work together and figure out a plan to satisfy, um, you know, the, each of us. I think I can speak to that as well in some of our collaborations. So sometimes when we have international protocols, they end up looking a little different across sites um, because of the different laws and the different resources. Um, I know for some of the protocols that we've had um, that, have, that are being kind of um, disseminated in, in a few different countries, some of the questions we've taken out of our protocols, if, if there's some risk questions that we don't feel like we can appropriately address um, in our population with our resources, we've maybe modified things to make sure that we're not bringing something up for a family that then we won't be able to to help or to manage over time. So I do think there's ways that there's there's going to be differences potentially, but I think like Dr. Uh, hey Fitzmearman said, we work as investigators and we talk together and we talk about the ethics more broadly as investigators about how do we navigate this because you know the ethics are really important we have to make sure we stay in law with the law in line with laws and regulations but but with all that we also have our own um you know professional ethics um so that i think i've always been in, in collaborative relationships with really amazing uh, partners so that you know just talk it talk it out together to make a plan Absolutely. Now, um, Dr. Masak, um, I was um, when, when I was preparing for this interview, I came across one of your um, university profile, um, and it says that that one of your goals, one one of the goals of your research is to advance the under understanding of potential and malleable screening variables and malleable factors. So, could you please talk more about these and malleable variables and malleable factors? Sure. So, I think kind of also in line with my overall goal of and passion to like make healthcare better for kids. Um, my research kind of has three different parts. The first is to understand those factors that you just referred to. And so when we think about malleable factors, those are the things that we can think about, what can we change? So we're looking for intervention targets. So for example, in some of the work that we do, what are um, different types of coping that might be more adaptive or less adaptive? Um, what are the way kids think about things? So we've identified that um, the way kids kind of process certain events and think about things can predict future trauma reactions or future distress. So those can be potential intervention targets, because if we can recognize the ways that they think about something and help them maybe reframe it in a different way, we could potentially shift outcomes over time. 
Um, so malleable factors. So the two of kind of the most, I think, um, well researched and established are um, certain types types of coping and certain types of appraisals and the way they, kids think about things as things that we can change over time. The factors that are less malleable, um, those are things that can really kind of tune us in to this child might be more at risk for having mental health challenges over time. And those are things that we might put in screening tools. And so things like um, it in certain populations, a child's um, sex might predict whether they're more at risk or less at risk for a certain mental health challenge. Um, things like their home environment have, might have some factors in it that might predict um, higher or lower risk potentially. So we look for both prote protective factors, um, things that are there like um, really strong family support. Um, we know that social support and strong family support can be a protective factor. So the research really looks to identify, so what are the things that we can figure out that we can't change, but we could still use to figure out which kids might have a harder time down the road that we might want to connect with resources? And then what are the things that we could change? And those things then we can infuse into evidence-based interventions like the silly coping kit that I talked about. Um, we have done some other interventions along the way for kids and families. Um, there's one called Coping Coach, which is an online program that we worked on, again, to try to really focus on changing the way kids kind of processed an acute medical event and thought about things. Um, and then the, the final piece of my work uh, is really about intervention. So we use those first two pieces about, okay, how do we figure out um, the things that are associated with longer mental health outcomes? And we infuse some of that. How do we screen for it? So what are they? How do we screen for it? And then let's use that to, to create interventions and get the kids that might need more help, more help along the way. Thank you. And Dr. Mehman, um, I just want to jump into one of your piece of um, research, because um, earlier you alluded to that you were teaching, if I understand it right, you were teaching young people to um, how to drive and so something about traffic. I'm really interested about it because I've got something to confess to you. I had six different driving instruct instructors and I never learned how to drive. I finally gave up last year. So um, tell us more about your um, research area. Did you also look into why people never learn how to drive? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as a developmental psychologist, especially as an applied developmental psychologist, you know, my, my interests are in making, you know, promoting, promoting healthy development and preventing injuries and um, promote, promoting positive healthy outcomes for kids. So I'm always thinking like, what can I do um, to, to make kids' lives better um, in an actionable, concrete way? And I was pretty far along, I would say, in my career before I realized, um, before I found out that unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death and disability for young people. Um, and motor vehicle crashes um, are a big contributor to that, you know, globally. Um, so, and it is kind of, you know, depending on where you are culturally, you know, driving can be a bit of a rite of passage. Um, in the U.S., we license teenagers very young <laughs> compared to here in the U.K. There are some states in the U.S. where you can get a driver's license as young as 14. Um, so, in here, I think it's around 18, you can kind of start that process. So, the difference between a 14 year old and 18 year old is vast. Um, so, yeah, so, and I would say when I first started, um, there was this kind of idea that um, crashes are inevitable. They just kind of happen. Um, you can't really do anything about them, they're accidents. Uh, but that's not really true. Um, they are preventable. So a lot of my research just focuses on like what are the reasons why young people get into crashes. And back, I would say in the '90s and you know early 2000s, there was this idea that um, teenagers have broken brains and that um, they're not fully developed yet. They're immature. They do a lot of hedonic risk taking. They're reckless. They don't understand. Um, or they don't care about the risks. And that's really generally for most kids not true. Um, so my research and the research of others has really shown that for most young people, the reason they get into car crashes as a, as a learner, as a new driver, is just because they don't know what they're doing yet. Um, they're just rookies. So they make a bunch of rookie mistakes. And as they gain experience, their crash risk comes down pretty quickly. Um, so what I have been interested in is developing intervention programs to expedite that learning curve, um, to just like, move it quicker. Um, and what I found through my research is that it isn't, you know, drive, learning to drive doesn't necessarily follow like a traditional learning curve. It's kind of jagged um, with step function changes depending on, you know, your skill profile, your personality. Um, some people are risk averse. Other people are more, more risk accepting. 
Um, and then just people's skills you know, matter differently. They have different motivations for wanting to drive. They need to drive for different reasons. Um, some, someone might need to drive for work or school. Other people might drive more recreationally. Um, we do know that males are at higher risk uh, because they engage in more risk-taking behaviors and they drive more than females. Um, so that's kind of on the radar for a lot of traffic prevention folks. Um, but yeah, as a developmental psychologist, it became really interesting to me because we spend a lot of time thinking about how young people learn to walk, how young people learn how to read or do maths um, or sports even. But here's this you know, skill that we know very little about um, and our biases about why young people do risky things really got in the way of us developing appropriate prevention programs for them. Absolutely. Now, um, for, for both of you, um, you you gave us a glimpse of your p pieces of work. So I'm quite sure that you've come across a number of misconceptions about um, your area of research about developmental psychology. So if you could um, sort of uh, mention some misconceptions and kind of address them. So um, let's start with um, Dr. Marsak. Um, what's um, some of the misconceptions that you've come across with your um, research? So when I think about um, trauma research in particular, and especially medical trauma, one of the things that comes to mind the most is that um, uh, medical providers in particular, but I think also just naturally human, human assumption is that the child's kind of response on mental health would be worse for an event that's worse. If the event is more objectively scary, or if the cancer diagnosis is more objectively dangerous, that it would um, that that one that would mean that those kids are at higher risk. And what we've seen from research is that it's really about how the child and the family experiences the event as to what their emotional health outcomes will be. So you could have a child, you know, that just had, you know, maybe just 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 broke a leg and they're going to be fine and they're going to recover um, in one, you know, but they're in the hospital for a few days. They went through a lot of stuff. Um, that that was like the worst thing that's ever happened to them. And, and they've kind of, they had, they were afraid they were going to die and they had all these kind of fears built in. You could have that child. Um, and then you could have a child next door that has a really poor prognosis with a cancer diagnosis. And what the assumption often is, is the child that is actually more likely to have a worse prognosis or have a poor outcome would be the child that we need to worry about more. Um, but what research has shown is it's not necessarily um, what looks the worst on paper, it's how the child's experienced it, how the family's experienced it. So I think that's one of the most common misconceptions. Um, another one that's kind of been cleared up over time um, is there was this idea for a while that if you had a tra like more trauma, you would kind of just get used to it, which is almost the opposite of, of the other misconception, but kind of the kids that like grew up in really maybe rough environments and had a lot of multiple traumas on, that they would end up being like a buffer over time. And what we know now is that the more trauma that you've had, the more risk that you are for having emotional trauma reactions over time. So you don't just get used to being traumatized. Um, we, we still like, if every time you have a trauma that increases your risk for, for trauma reactions. Those are the two big ones that kind of, that stick out for me in my field. Okay, thank you. And what about you, Dr. Mehman? Um, any you know, blatant misconception for you that you'd like to address? I guess I would say just like an overarching one, um, which would just be that, you know, developmental psychology is easy. Um, it's not. Um, so it's actually quite difficult um, because, you know, from a scientific perspective and from a methodological perspective, you're, you have kids who change over time, who interact with people and environments and places, and it's, they have agency. So you get a lot of recipro reciprocal interactions between people and contexts and um, that needs to be measured really carefully. And um, yeah, I would just say it's actually quite difficult to do well. Um, you know, and if you're, if you're gonna take, you know, context effects seriously, and like, so, you know, you need to figure out ways to measure it. Um, and if you're gonna develop intervention programs and um, like Megan and I have, um, you know, you need to evaluate them in context, <laughs> in the context of appropriate ways. And planning those studies um, out takes a lot of time and is difficult and requires a lot of thoughtfulness. Um, so I think a misconception is, you know, when I tell people, you know, I'm a developmental psychologist, they're like, oh, you must really like kids. And, you know, I do really like kids, that it, but it takes more than just, you know, an affinity for children to do the job well. Um, so it's, you know, can be very mathy at times. 
um, which I welcome. You know, I think it's fun. But I would say that's the biggest one, the kind of overall one. Um, it's a hard science, um, worthwhile but hard. Um, and then the other one I mentioned was that um, teenagers are just bound for risk taking, and that it's inevitable, and there's nothing you can do. We just have to accept it and just like strap in and like hope for the best. Um, you know, research has shown that that's not that's not really true. Um, you know, kids are not hardwired for risk taking in that sense. Um, they're very thoughtful um, people, um, and I kind of tend to be like a glass half full person when it comes to kids. So they're very resilient. Um, very capable. Um, and so if we kind of take an asset-based approach, as opposed to thinking about, especially teenagers in terms of deficits, what they can't do, why they're broken, what's wrong, um, we can flip the script a little bit and think about how to promote their assets, you know, things would, we would be able to, have, we would probably have more effective programs for them now. Well, thank you for shedding lights on those um, misconceptions, Dr. Marsak and Dr. Mehman. Now, um, a lot of people who will be watching this are actually young people just trying to figure out um, the sort of career trajectory that they want to take. So um, as developmental psychologists, can you recommend sources and events to those who wants to follow your footsteps and any um, career advice? Um, Dr. Masak. Sure. So my training is as a clinical psychologist, um, so I can speak a little bit more to that piece of things. Um, I think one of the best things you can do is talk to people in the field and get an idea of the different career trajectories. Um, different people take different paths along the way um, and just and really ask the questions that are important in your life. So one thing that I always share with me, mentees, we always talk about work life balance and what the different paths might look like for that. Um, and, and which path might have more flexibility in the short term, which path might have more flexibility in the long term, and really thinking about where you're at in your space and what you want your long term life to look, look like. Um, so I think really talking to as many people as you can that have jobs that are of interest, you know, of course, if you have time to volunteer in the field and, and get a closer look, if you want to go into psychology, I, I would think and Dr. Hey, Fitzmerman can, can speak to this as well. But either clinical psychology or developmental psychology, getting some research experience early on to see what does that really look like? I think the the when we present the final result of research, that can look much different than the hours and hours of very sometimes tedious yet really important things that go on behind the scenes. There's some really cool things about research and um, but there's some other really complex things that go along with that and to see if you really um, that's something that's of interest to you. And the same thing clinically, if you want to focus and be more like a therapist, like what does that look like day to day? What is the flexibility with that? What are the pressures of that? So just asking um, colleagues a lot of questions um, to find out um, what could be what might be of, of interest to you and see what fits for not just your goals, but also the life you want to live. Absolutely. And Dr. Merman, do you want to add to that? Um, probably you could mention some sources and events that they could um, explore if they want to learn more about developmental psychology as a preparation for um, a career in that line of work. Yeah, sure. So I, I, agree, I agree with what Dr. Marzak said. So talk to people is good. Um, I think the, both the BPS and APA have career development information like on their website. So that would be the American Psychological Association and the British Psychological uh, Society have that information like available on their web on their web source on their websites. Um, the APA I know also publishes like a gigantic book called I think it's like the APA Graduate Study in Psychology. It's it's huge, um, but it lists all the graduate programs. Um, so you know, that that can be you know, checked out at the library. And I think that's in I don't know if it's international. Or not. It might just be specific to the U.S. Um, but those are some two good good sources to start. Um, looking at um, just to say, and I, I think it's important to think about um, working backwards from what your goal is. So I think a lot of students, some or a lot of prospective students, kind of focus on like if I want a PhD, um, or you know, and don't think necessarily about like to what end. So the the educational degree is kind of a means to an end. So just try to think of, and it doesn't have to be permanent, a permanent end, a career end in that way, but just to think ultimately what you want to do. Um, I think one of the things I like about my career is that it's allowed me to do a lot of different things that I'm interested in and explore research questions that I'm interested in. 
I do, you know, I have academic stuff, so I do, um, I publish papers, I also make interventions, I've been involved on teams that have made car seats that are now available for distribution. Um, Dr. Marzak talked a little bit about um, her, her cell, the cell intervention, which I can say I've purchased for a friend um, who needed it. Um, and I know she's recently also written a book, um, which is really interesting, so hoping maybe we can like segue away and she can tell us a little bit about it, if that's okay. Yeah, so I think, um, like Dr. Hafitz Meerman said, I, I also really like the flexibility in my job. I'm somebody who likes to do lots of different things. And so this, the opportunity to be a clin clinical psychologist affords me the opportunity to do some research, to do some teaching, do education of healthcare providers, and to do clinical care. And also, it gave me the ability to launch the company that we talked about already. And I just, just this summer, released a book called Afraid of the Doctor, a guide for parents on preventing and managing medical trauma. Um, so uh, I was able to co-write that with an author um, who is a mom of a child with Hunter syndrome. And so we really brought together in that book the parent's perspective of what it's like to have a child with a really severe medical per um, medical condition and to navigate all the like the the emotional and behavioral challenges along with that as well with the my, my perspective of, of a psychologist as well and so in being in academia um, that allowed me the flexibility to be able to write that book um, some of my own time of course but some some as part of being a faculty member um, so I think really thinking about for me I love the different flexibility of things um, and just being able to do lots of different things Absolutely. Now, um, Dr. Mehman, could you just um, um, talk a bit about the import? Because you're, you're not just researchers, but you're also science communicators. So could you give us some ideas of the importance of um, science communication and knowledge exchange? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I was kind of raised on the idea that we need to give science away. Um, it's not just for us. If, we, if, if, you know, if it doesn't get out, what good is that? Um, especially for those of us who do applied work. I mean, it's, you know, if, if parent, if our, you know, if we're working with parents and kids, then parents and kids need to know about our research findings. Um, we also, you know, owe it to our research participants, like for those people who have volunteered their time and donated their time to participate in our studies, they should find out about the results of, of that, uh, those endeavors. Um, so, you know, as part of my graduate program, we had specific workshops on giving science away. So it included things about like how to write white papers, how to write for the lay press, how to engage with community members to think about um, ways to give back. Um, so it's part of that research cycle. Um, and also in that giving back process, you can learn new research ideas that are generated by the community um, that um, you might not have considered previously. Um, this also, I think, serves as like a good, like check for me. Um, I quite like it because it's, you know, it does kind of offer um, like some immediacy. So for those of us who, like, I'm not in clinical practice, um, but, you know, I, I come in, I teach sometimes. Um, the research horizon, though, is quite long, as, as Dr. Marzik was saying. So like, the re like, by the time, if you have an idea and you write a grant and that hopefully that grant gets funded, <laughs> then you do the project. Um, it's years later by the time that paper like might come out um, about it's really it's many many years so you know you want to have an impact and that's one of the ways that we can do that is by collaborating with people and institutions and communities community groups to get the word out about about our scientific findings um, to put them into practice and get them into the hands of the people who need them so for me it's always just been a core part of what I've always been trained to do and to value and to appreciate and I know in academia, it's, it's a very publisher, parish culture, and we often kind of measure our worth by the number of publications we have. But I think for me, my guiding, my rudder, the thing that's always kind of pushed me is like, am I making a difference? And, you know, not everyone reads my papers. Um, so, you know, there, there's other ways to get the word out. So I think, um, you know, I enjoy writing pieces like the piece that Dr. Marzak and I, I wrote, and I was able to get it, you know, into a WhatsApp chat that I was in for moms for um, both my kids' classes who were who needed it, um, who were you know stressed. Um, there, it's, it's been a stressful time for people, um, you know. So just kind of looking all the way back to kind of why we're here at the beginning, it's you know um, kids, you know, getting sick in increasing numbers, and you know, you know, most of them are going to be okay. But it's coming at a time where, where um, carers um, are very depleted. 
like in with respect to you know we've been dealing with this pandemic for a really long time and we need to be super strong and thoughtful for our kids right now um, but we're kind of also at the end of our ropes so just kind of enabling you know making it as easy as possible for 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 parents to have these common important conversations with their kids is really important. And I don't think, that, I didn't think the path for that was necessarily a paper. Um, and that was something Dr. Marzak and I chatted a lot about, like what's the right venue for this? Um, and we do have another um, more academic product that's more aimed towards clinicians that we've partnered on um, that hopefully will be coming out soon. But the parent piece we felt like needed to go to parents. Do you have anything you would add to that? Or? Yeah, so I think that that's exactly right. Like the, I actually am part of an international collaboration looking at mental health of preschool kids and and caregivers of preschool kids throughout this pandemic. And we, you know, we launched this. We've got eight countries, maybe more than that, now involved in collecting this data, which is really helpful to understand how hard it is. I mean, I think that's really what we're we're finding is it's really hard, kind of no matter your circumstance. People are really struggling that, you know, some of the data says there's some good stuff too. like some families have really connected and there's, um, you know, some families have have gotten extra time with their kids and and some people have found that their community stands up for them. I mean, so there's, you know, there's some good stuff, too. Um, but to get that all the way out into the into the journals and the academics, you know, and, and trying to figure out then what does that mean and who do you need to get it to? So to, to write things like what um, Dr. Hafez Mirman and I were able to collaborate on um, was great because we can get that information to parents quickly in a way that's consumable so that they can take a look at it. Um, and so I think that that really, uh, I love doing that kind of work too, like direct to parents and figuring out um, how can we really support our kids and families at the time when they need them. I know that was one of the articles that was shared quite a bit around um, through social media on, on over here. It, it made its way around pretty quickly because I think it was so needed. Absolutely. And like what you've said, there are different ways of sharing your, your work and arguably um, th this might also be a form of science communication. So I have to thank you um, for taking part in this interview. Now, um, Dr. Masek and Dr. Mirman, um, we've already learned um, a few bits about your work as, as academics, as researchers. But for um, the last questions that I save for you, um, I just want to learn more about the human side of you. Um, not just the researchers. So um, my first question is, um, who inspires you both professionally and personally? Um, Dr. Merman. Gosh, that's a big one. <laughs> who inspires me most? Um, I, would, I would say my grandparents, actually. Um, my father's parents, um, they're passed away now, but um, my grandfather, um, they're both immigrants. They came, my grandfather was Russian, he immigrated to the United States. Um, and my grandmother was um, Polish and a Holocaust survivor and she immigrated to Canada and then to the United States. Um, and they just were the most loving, kind people that, you know, and extraordinarily resilient people. My grandfather was, um, he had a medical practice and he, you know, back when people, when doctors would see patients in their homes and make house calls and um, he was a family practitioner. And my grandmother uh, ran the business side of his medical practice and like did the books and that sort of thing. And she was a philanthropist. So she believed very much that, you know, the purpose of why we're here is to make life better, make the world a better place. That's, you know, at the end of the day, like, what have you done today? Like, how have you helped? How have you helped, basically? So for me, I never really approached work. I've had the luxury, I should say, of not having to approach work as just a paycheck. Like, I've had the luxury and the privilege of being thinking a little bit more about um, how to make it meaningful. Um, and I, I recognize that not everybody is in that position, but I've been you know, lucky enough to be in that position. Um, but they, you know, they've inspired me, you know, just to think, thinking about everything, especially that they've gone through, especially everything that my grandmother has gone through, everybody that she's lost, like she's experienced a lot of trauma, actually, uh, thinking about this. Um, and she still kind of was really thoughtful about, you know, Yes, she, she lost a lot, but other people lose things every day. And how do we make the world a better place? So um, that's kind of what I think about. And, you know, that, that does keep me moving. Um, I do, you know, I like science for science sake. You know, I, I like a good puzzle. You know, I do intellectually, I like the intellectual challenge, but I also want to know that my work 
is matters. And I never thought that I'd be focusing on teen drivers, honestly. Like it's kind of when people, when I tell people about it, they like think I'm some kind of like weird driver's ed instructor. And then I'm just like, I'm actually not a licensed driver myself right now. So um, my license expired during COVID and I just found out if I, and I have to start all over again at the beginning. I'm not looking forward to doing that. Um, but you know, it is kind of a weird pocket to be in. Um, but I'm here because it, it is where the problem is. It's the leading cause of death for young people. And I don't want families to lose more kids. I just don't. Um, and I've had enough interactions with the parent advocates over the years. I've had, you know, friends who have died um, when I was younger um, or been injured um, and has affected their lives um, and the lives of, you know, their families in profound ways. And, you know, I would like to, you know, move towards vision zero as we call it in the traffic safety community. So that's what inspires me, like my grandparents and then, um, yeah, just the things I've seen. Thank you. Yeah. Guys. Yeah. Thank you. What about you, um, Dr. Maza? Who's your source of inspiration? Oh my goodness! I feel like there's so much. Um, I think personally, if I had to just pick one, it would probably be my parents. I was really blessed to grow up with parents that were kind and still are kind, and driven to help others and to serve others. Uh, my dad is a, a practicing dentist, and my mom is a physical therapist, and she worked with kids that had cognitive and um, physical limitations. And so, you know, I grew up kind of in both of their professional places, volunteering at my mom's work and working. I worked in the dental office for a while. So my dissertation is actually on dental anxiety, um, which, you know, is, is kind of fitting for, for all of that. Um, and, and my dad's very good and very patient. So he wasn't causing all the dental anxiety, I promise. Um, but they were, they were, I think, a, an inspiration to me and also just people that I know are in my corner. So it, it also helped me professionally to know that I could experiment with things and try different things um, professionally, knowing that, you know, you've got somebody cheering you on along the way. Um, so I, I think probably personally, I would say definitely my parents. Um, professionally, there's so many. I would say probably one of the, the biggest inspirations, aside from um, some amazing mentors that I've had, um, is the kids that I work with. And so one of the absolute coolest things to see is when you've been working with a child that has had a really, really challenging event or the, a trauma. Um, some of the kids that come to mind specifically are the kids that have like needle phobias, but yet their medical treatment requires them to come in and get stuck with needles sometimes every week, every month, every day. And you come up and partner with them with a plan and to watch them just champion going from having an actual like phobia to just like climbing up on the table, like, you know, and, and being ready for their needle stick. Um, and to just, it's just amazing. Kids are just amazing creatures. Um, so I think I, I would say that they're a big inspiration for me. And I've also had just some amazing professionals in my life and collaborators as well. Absolutely. And um, Dr. Marsa, what do you think you would be doing if you didn't work as a psychologist? Oh my goodness. That's such a great question. So I, what I would like to be doing, I would say is either potentially working in a bookstore or teaching kids yoga. Um, but I do trip over my own, own two feet. So I think even though I would dream of being an amazing kid yoga instructor, I probably don't have that skill set. Um, so I, I don't know, really, I thought about law school for a while. Um, but I think something with kids for sure, because that really, that's kind of where I, I get my energy and my joy. What about you, Dr. Mehman? Well, the real answer to my question is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I'll say it anyway. So I put my like big business idea is to open up a bar and a petting zoo. Mm -hmm. So that I just combine two of my things. I've been told though that I'll never get that insured, so it won't work. Um, but I do like animals and I do like chat. So um, those are, that's probably what I would be doing. Okay. And finally, what else is in the pipeline? Um, um, tell us again, any side projects, any re remind us again of your book. And if people wanted to reach out to you, what platforms can they get in touch with you at? Um, okay, other things down the road. So um, our, our research lab is always doing work around um, investigating what contributes to post traumatic stress across different medical conditions. Um, we've got a, a few different projects in the pipeline. I'm happy to, to talk with people if, if they want to reach out. We're always looking for new collaborations as well. Um, we'll have some four time point data around COVID and COVID outcomes in kids in preschools and caregivers that's, that we're going to be finished collecting over the next, gosh, maybe nine months or so here. 
Um, we've got an NIH funded trial going on right now where we're collecting data on a tool that um, looks at emotional and some physical health outcomes in a game-based environment so that kids can go and play a game and kind of rate their symptoms right in the context of a game post-discharge from the hospital. Hospital. So we'll we'll see what that turns out. So got, we always have kind of a lot of projects, which might not surprise you if you've heard all the different things that I like to do. I like to stay busy. Um, you know, we just released the book. So we've done um, some different um, advocacy for trying to get that integrated into different places as well. We're hoping that the Afraid of the Doctor book um, will be helpful to, to kids and parents um, along the way. Um, and then the, for the Sally Coping Company, we've got a couple collaborations. We're creating a couple new different versions of, of the coping kit currently. So more will be coming out on that. Um, I am on LinkedIn and Twitter and I think those are the I think those are my two current platforms that I'm mostly using um, professionally at the moment. So I think those are probably the two easiest um, platforms. Or you can also email me at, at the university to get a hold of me. Okay, and Dr. Mehman. Sure. So as I mentioned, you know I've been um, interested in developing intervention programs to prevent motor vehicle crashes uh, for teenagers. So I've been doing that for the past you know decade or so. And um, just this past the, the summer, um, I launched a trial, randomized control trial that's out of the University of Pennsylvania with my colleagues, um, Dr. McDonald and Dr. Long. Um, and that's called the Drivingly trial, and that's at drivingly.org. Um, oh, so basically what I did was, um, it's going to sound inelegant, but I took all the interventions that I've made that have been shown to be successful and I put them together um, into a comprehensive program for parents and uh, teenagers. Um, so that consists of one-to-one -one set coaching sessions for parents at two points um, during the learning to drive process, um, a psychoeducational curriculum for parents and teens that they do together, workbook activities, and then in a very comprehensive on-road uh, test uh, uh, intervention and feedback process that goes to families. So more, inter more information about that trial is at drivingmind.org. We are currently recruiting. We would love to have more participants, as always. Um, so um, if anyone's interested about that, you can check out the website there. Um, and that's taken up a lot of my time, honestly, uh, especially with uh, making it COVID safe. Um, so that, that's been a fun wrinkle for any kind of primary data collection. But I'm looking forward to the results of them. So. Okay. I hope well, that that's out and available by the time my children are teenagers. <laughs> I'm already nervous about, um, you know, kids learning to drive. So I'm ready. I'm ready for that program myself. They will be ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Dr. Omega Masak and Dr. Jessica hayfitz um, It's a pleasure having you here on the DRH show, but unfortunately, time is against us. I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you Thank for you having so us. Much. Take care.